All right, so uh, I'm excited to be able to talk a little bit about uh, Strobex and what it can do for uh, stellar mass black holes. And in particular, you've heard a lot today about reflection, reverberation, wonderful things. I'm going to be speaking about uh, continuum fitting. Uh, so maybe uh, not quite as wild, but um, in fact, I think some of what makes continuum fitting so nice is its uh, inherent simplicity. Uh, so the, the goal, the, the main objective when you're uh, sort of applying continuum disk models is to measure the inner radius of the disk. And uh, just to recap what we've heard a bit about is the main reason we want to measure the inner disk radius is, uh, is often to measure black hole spin. Sometimes it might be to search for a location, but in general, one's trying to measure spin uh, by using the radius of the disco, the innermost stable circular orbit, as a proxy for the black hole spin. Uh, the reason we can do this is general relativity gives us this wonderful monotonic mapping between uh, the disco radius and the spin of the black hole, varying by a factor of six for a, a non-spinning Schwarzschild black hole to a maximally rotating curved black hole, or up to nine for retrograde spins, where the disk is orbiting uh, uh, counter to the sense of the black hole spin. Uh, and just to illustrate this uh, very schematically for you, uh, here are two twin black holes that are uh, identical mass and differ only by having uh, different spins. So here's a non-rotating black hole where the disk is much further out, so the inner, inner edge is much cooler, uh, and uh, the system is much less luminous compared to the high-spinning uh, counterpart here where the inner radius goes much further in, uh, and the corresponding inner disk temperature is much higher, the system is much brighter, and so on. Um, so just uh, to flesh this out in uh, a much more detail, this is a very nice analogy to one of the simplest problems we uh, teach our students in astronomy. Uh, we say, well, how do we measure the size of a star, given that usually we can't resolve a, uh, a star uh, at its angle on the sky. Um, and to measure the size of the star, we simply take advantage of the fact that stars are very similar, they're, they're approximately black bodies, and of course, with a single spectrum, we can measure the, uh, the peak emission from the star, so that is, we can get its temperature, and we can uh, put a bolometer on, get its total flux. Uh, and then if you also can get at its distance from parallax or some other technique, then uh, with just flux, temp flux temperature and distance, you can uniquely determine first an opening area on the sky, uh, and then turn that with the distance into uh, a unique radius. So it's uh, a simple and familiar problem. Um, and disks are exactly the same kind of problem, only uh, we have an extra uh, uh, degree of freedom. We have an inclination in the system now, so it's not a sphere, it's a cylinder, so we need to know the projection angle. Uh, so, so that means we need flux temperature, uh, distance, and inclination. But otherwise, the schema is exactly the same. Now, we, we don't have just a single temperature black body. A disk happens to have a characteristic multicolor black body uh, uh, profile, but the boundary condition is the same. So that is just a single X-ray spectrum. We can measure flux and temperature, and then if we also know distance and inclination, we measure inner radius. The trick is, though, that we're not actually after inner radius is the sort of fundamental quantity of interest. We're after spin. So to, to turn a dimensional, dimensionalized uh, ISCO radius and units of kilometers into a dimensionless spin, we need to scale by scale out the mass. So we also need to know the mass. Uh, that is distance, inclination, and mass let us turn a single observation into a spin measurement. Um, and uh, some further, just uh, more nuanced requirements, we want, the, in general, that the observation in question is dominated by uh, the accretion disk component that we're trying to measure. Um, and we need theory to come in and tell us, well, what is the link between uh, the, the flux profile, that is the, the, you know, the temperature of a given radius, um, uh, for a given spin and accretion rate and so on. And luckily, this was solved way, uh, in, in the 70s by Novikov and Thorne, uh, Page and Thorne fixed a, a small issue. But basically, this is a well-established theory for decades now. Uh, and it's uh, uh, by GR standards, not a, a tricky problem. Um, so uh, as we have very well-established theory that shows us that uh, as you spin up a black hole for, uh, in these curves, a fixed mass accretion rate, you increase the emission everywhere and it becomes, the whole system becomes much more luminous and much hotter. So the question of course is, well this is very well and good, it's, it's a simple theory, how well does this work in practice? Uh, and what I think is very powerful in fact is that this technique works incredibly well and we can demonstrate that uh, empirically. 
we, uh, I'll show you in a second that uh, for one of my favorite black hole systems, LMCX3, we've been able to look at a uh, time span of several decades. We've used uh, numerous X-ray instruments with very different uh, spectral uh, characteristics, and we've been able to look at uh, a large range of variability, as you see in this light curve over time. Uh, LMCX3 is uh, it's persistently active, but it is uh, uh, by nomenclature a transient. It's fed by Roche overflow, so it's always bouncing around by a, a couple orders of magnitude in mass accretion rate and in luminosity. So we take advantage of uh, this wonderful system, uh, pick out a range in luminosity that our model, our thin disk model is applicable, uh, which is about an order of magnitude. And when we measure the spin over this order of magnitude range in <coughs> luminosity over these decades in time, using these very different X-ray instruments, we get uh, a consistent result to within about 5%. Uh, so this is hundreds of spectra, and this is uh, the strongest empirical foundation for measuring spin uh, that, that we have to date. And certainly it uh, bolsters confidence in this continuum fitting method. Um, and I, I should mention that, uh, you know, you haven't seen a spectrum yet, but this is the kind of data that we're uh, working with. These are spectra uh, in this thermal state that are really dominated by it, where 90% where plus of the emission is coming from this thermal disk component. Uh, nature doesn't ever give us a pure thermal disk, unfortunately. We always have this nuisance Compton power law. I guess Javier's very interested in that or something. Uh, in, in practice, we tend to isolate the data in which this thermal disk is really most of the story. Uh, and so taking some tens or hundreds of those sort of spectra, we can uh, put them together, fold in our uncertainties in mass, inclination, and distance, which are usually derived from uh, ground-based data, and we can measure spin uh, to a, some, some pretty good confidence. Here I'm showing you up top uh, the actual measurement units of, of radius, so we get uh, something like a, a 10, 20% result in terms of radius, and depending on your value of spin, that uh, could map into a very different precision in, in spin. Okay, so this is all backdrop, but now I'd really like to turn my focus uh, on what it is that we'll be able to do with uh, Strobax. There are some very exciting um, outcomes of, of Strobax looking at these continuum spectra. Uh, and just to orient us, uh, this is a spectrum of that same uh, system, LMCX3, uh, where I've highlighted for you in uh, yellow and in red the band passes of the XRCA uh, and of the lab and you see that you get incredible coverage for both of the thermal disk, uh, but the, the, the XRCA is really centered on the, the disk emission itself, and it misses this Compton power law. So with NICER, uh, this is very much what we're looking at, uh, and the one, the one weakness of NICER looking at these systems is that we don't have this complementary coverage of the Compton power law, which is really something we uh, important for anchoring the disk spectrum, otherwise there's sort of a, a looseness to the degree to which this Compton power law can, can torque around the, the measurements. Uh, but the lab completely anchors that, and this, this high energy coverage is, is really essential, uh, not only for you know getting Compton humps and things, but also for getting uh, the, the real thermal disk component isolated. Um, what really blows me away is what we can do on a dynamical time scale and I mean a dynamical time scale in the inner disk with uh, Strobex for a stellar mass black hole. So this is a time scale that I remember being at uh, a meeting in uh, 2010 or 2011, and it was sort of thrown out that, you know, oh, this dynamical time scale is something we, uh, we will never access it with for these stellar black hole systems. We can do it for AGM, though, and that's wonderful. Well, Strobex is changing that. With uh, Strobex, in uh, a, a hundredth of a second, you can get thousands of counts for a, a few crab source. And this is not some magical, exceptional black hole system that we won't observe on the sky. There's a, a transient right now which is brighter than the three crab source that went into this simulated spectrum that gives uh, a count rate of, by the way, about uh, one and a half million counts per second. So this is just we're just swimming in signal from these stellar mass black holes, and it's, it's just marvelous. And uh, John asked earlier, I think, something about the uh, division of signal between the XRCA and the LAD. 
uh, it's really, really close to 50-50 for these thermal states. So you're really getting um, uh, incredible, impressive uh, synergy between the two. Um, and of course, right as the, uh, the XRCA starts falling off around the iron, that's where you really get a lot from the lag. So these really do bolster each other in important ways. Um, so I, I don't know exactly what accessing a dynamical time scale. I, 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 should, I should come clean. I'm cheating very slightly. A, a, a hundredth of a second is uh, some, some theorists might uh, say, well, that's not really a dynamical time scale. This is uh, the orbit at about 10 RG. This is one orbit um, in the inner disk. Uh, so uh, I, I've, I've come clean with you guys. Um, and just to put this into perspective, uh, with NICER, I think we're really doing something brand new by accessing uh, the viscous time scale in the inner radius or in the inner disk, uh, and we're able to do that by getting roughly a 10% disk measurement. I should say that's a relative disk measurement. To put it on an absolute scale, we need, you know, presuming that we don't have a mass inclination distance, but in terms of an uh, a relative scaling, we can get to about 10% in a second or a few seconds with nicer, but with Strobex we're doing that on these orbital time scales. And uh, if there is variation happening on dynamical time scales, we will see that. And for the first time uh, with, with NICER, or uh, with Strobex. And this is something that um, is very important for building faith in the, uh, uh, the thermal, model, thermal disk models that we are using that underpin this whole spin <coughs> enterprise. Um, so, uh, you know. We have every reason to have confidence in them, but if there is some pernicious uh, effect, this would suss it out. Um, importantly also, this uh, opens up the possibility of doing phase-resolved spectroscopy of high-frequency QPOs. So certainly this is something new that's been very exciting uh, and groundbreaking for low-frequency QPOs. And you heard earlier about how Adam Ingram is applying the RPM model with success uh, on low-frequency QPOs, looking at iron lines and so on for those uh, we can do that now for the high frequency QPOs that are thought to be linked to black hole spin that are uh, uh, you know, at the time scale of, the, of dy dynamics of the inner disk. Um, in terms of what happens at the viscous time scale, uh, we're now just in this incredible regime of having millions of counts in our data and we just have uh, such, uh, such a wonderful signal that, that you know, the, the precision with which you're measuring inner radius is far beyond, I think, I mean, it's just reasonable systematic limit. This is far less than a percent in terms of uh, a statistical limit of, of radius that we can get on a time scale of a second. Um, and another reason why this is going to be very important for uh, stellar mass black hole systems is just to show you here the, the Q or turtle hardness intensity diagram we've seen a few times now for stellar mass black holes. Uh, what we've really been operating in for making these spin measurements has been sort of restricted to this little window here in, um, in performing continuum fitting. And what I think we'll be able to do with Strobex is open that up to a much larger range of parameter space. And I'll say in a couple slides why I think that is. Um, I'm highlighting the possibility of accessing this uh, uh, bright hard state as well, but I, that's, that's a little more speculative. Um, so to orient us on the behavior of stellar mass black holes more, more broadly, this is the RX2E roadmap of every uh, black hole observation that, that the PCA collected. And you see that um, uh, hardness and versus count rate with the RMS variability encoded in the color scale. So really, we were sort of operating on the, the purplest of these points at sort of middling luminosities, but you see that there is much more data that's outside of that little uh, golden box I showed you before. And uh, Strobex, I think, will really uh, you know, triple or something the, the amount of available uh, parameter real estate that we can access for stellar mass black holes. Um, so uh, I'm going to dive right into how it is that we're going to do that. So one thing that we have with, uh, that we can do with Strobex is take advantage of the enormous count rates, this, this incredible signal fidelity on accretion time scales uh, to, uh, to look at the structure of the accretion disk in a way that has simply not been possible before. So this is showing you a one kilosecond observation of the same LMCX3. And just to be conservative, I picked LMCX3 when it's at about the 20% uh, lowest 
brightness that it, that it goes to. So 80% of the time it's brighter than this. Uh, and here you're seeing the, the signal and the XRCA in the lab. And uh, I've put in uh, Shane Davis's BH spec model and, and comparing it to Kirby D, which assumes a perfect black body like shape to the spectrum. Shane Davis's model takes care of a lot of non thermal effects uh, related to uh, atomic features and electron scattering and so on. And you see that there are deviations, there's little ripples in the spectrum, and we've not been able to detect these before. Uh, it was tried and Nothing, uh, nothing came of it, but you see that these deviations, um, in part because we have access to a very broad spectral band pass encompassing the peak, the uh, very low energy and the, the high energies, um, we're able to nail this down uh, and access these few percent deviations around the thermal peak. So this will inform our knowledge of disk structure fundamentally. Uh, but more than just that, uh, the model that I showed you this, that's been the operational basis for making these spin measurements is really a thin disk model. That is where the disk is geometrically thin and optically thick. But we know that uh, when disks become very bright, they puff up due to radiation pressure and enter in uh, domains that have been called uh, you know, slim disk and so on, which is where they're appreciably thick. The models for slim disks have been kind of unsuccessful in accessing this higher luminosity domain and what we can do with Strobex, and uh, to some degree also uh, we'll be exploring this with NICER, is look at what happens when we're uh, checking these, these sources with very beautiful isolated thin or, uh, thermal disks and uh, look at them at low luminosities and very high luminosities and we'll be able to see these uh, departures that take place and come up with an empirical map of what happens to the disk structure. So we won't have to be tethered to a uh, theory that right now seems to not quite uh, cut it, and we'll be able to develop an empirical basis for this, challenge theorists, and uh, improve our knowledge of this disk this, this structure, and I'm sure that will inform other aspects of um, accretion theory as well. So this is showing you uh, just a, a simulation uh, using one of these uh, slim disk structures compared to the nominal thin disk, and uh, the size of this significance in a kilosecond is hundreds of sigma. Um, so I'm Running over on time, so I, I should, I'm just going to skip ahead to a couple of quick highlights um, and just show you with 1915 what we've done with uh, NICER already is we've been able to use uh, this, this incredible view of the disk that we have with NICER to look at variations that happen uh, in these sort of unstable oscillatory cycles uh, to measure changes in, in the inner disk where it's sort of a breathing mode that happens on time scales of tens of seconds. So this is something we've been able to map out very nicely with NICER. Uh, and we'll be able to do this uh, to precision that's just silly with Strobex. And for many of these uh, systems, we, we don't see such variations. But it could be that these, these uh, variations are just all very muted compared to what we see in 1915. So this is something we'll be able to uh, search for with Strobex uh, in a brand new way. Um, and lastly, I want to open up the possibility of going beyond these galactic systems that uh, that are, are sort of very familiar to those of us in the stellar black hole community. So this is uh, a list of some uh, 20 stellar mass black holes that was com complete as of, uh, I guess, close to a decade ago. Now. So there are a few more entries in the list uh, for the dynamically confirmed black holes. But if we were to go beyond just uh, our Milky Way and the LMC and go into the local group, we might have uh, a list of black hole systems. Uh, which would look something like this. Um, please don't pay attention to the repeated names. It's, uh, but this would really be something if we had a, an assemblage of 50 to 100 stellar mass black holes where we had masses and we had spins. That would be a census of a, a different character and a different quality. Uh, and I think that would really be uh, important and impressive, especially in the age of gravitational waves, where we will know a lot about very distant merging systems from early in the history of our universe. Um, but which may be not that, they may be similar, but they, from the first event, we see by virtue of the mass alone that they're not similar to what we've observed so far. So uh, if they are of a different character, um, it would be good to have observational data near at hand uh, to, to challenge that and to look at what we see locally for spin distributions, mass distributions, and so on. And so I'd like to quickly touch upon how Strobex could access this. But I, I don't think it will be, it's, it's not an obvious choice and it may not be worth it, but I think 
it would be wrong to not explore this possibility. So the first and serious drawback to going for extragalactic systems is that the lab really uh, is very limited in what it can do. Unless we have a very isolated, bright system, the lab, unfortunately, is not going to uh, give us something for these. Uh, uh, and, and I should say, when I'm talking extragalactic, I, I mean our local group, probably most people who do extragalactic um, science would scoff at that definition, but uh, I really mean within a few megaparsecs, um, and that's primarily the 50 or so uh, galaxies in our local group. Um, so the lab is not going to be helpful, uh, and I, I note also that this will be competing directly with sort of what Athena can do and in Athena's domain of imaging science. I think also to be able to do this well, we would uh, really want to tamp down, uh, squeeze as, as much as we can the XRCA field of view. So I had a, an informal conversation with Zabin, so I guess I, I hope I'm not um, saying things that I shouldn't, but Zabin indicated it might be possible to push to within two arc minutes on the, um, uh, on the concentrator optics. So going from nice years, three arc minute radius down to about, uh, optimistically, I'm, I'm calling that one and a half. If that's possible, this is showing you uh, NGC 1313, which um, for ULX fans out there, this has a couple of, of very nice ones. So it's at four megaparsecs, and just, just for a feel for comparison, to give us a flavor of this, you're seeing uh, there are a few dozen X-ray point sources in this field, and you can see that within one and a half arc minutes, we can do a reasonable job for a lot of these bright systems. Uh, once we get to three arc minutes, we're letting in a few point sources. We're introducing confusion. So uh, it will certainly be a trade-off no matter what, where this cut occurs and on different systems, but I think uh, this, is, this is where uh, Storbex will live. So I think we need to rely to some large degree on an extra imager to inform our science program uh, without question on this. So these are the negatives. I wanted to end on the positives. So why go for this? Well, for one thing, um, what we can do with Strobex is, is just astounding given its collecting area. So in uh, a few hundreds to a kilosecond, hundreds of seconds to a kilosecond, we can have uh, a sufficient signal to measure uh, a spin or to measure an inner radius in any event. So it doesn't take much time on a given system, and because everything's in, in roughly one field, uh, I'm assuming we can dither very quickly between systems, and in something like 10 kiloseconds, we can polish off one local group object, uh, I, assuming that the overheads of doing those little motions is, is not substantial. Uh, when we do that, the distance is known precisely. This turns out the distance when we're measuring black hole spins in the galaxy is often one of the biggest sources of uncertainty, and that's just going here. Uh, we don't know mass and inclination, but I'd like to remind you guys that when Strobex would fly, we'll be in a different era of ground-based astronomy than we are today. We'll be in the era of big blasts, where it's possible to go for masses and inclinations within the local group for essentially any uh, black hole binary that's not enormously obscured in that in this local group object, uh, you can get um, spectra uh, down to about R of 26. So this covers the expected low mass X-ray binaries uh, and high mass X-ray binaries uh, with adaptive optics on a GMT or an ELT and so on. Uh, so this is all possible. Um, and uh, I think one thing that I, I, I like in envisioning this is the idea of establishing Strobex as the black hole monitor. So perhaps Athena uh, can do these occasional looks in these fields and show us where the X-ray point sources are. But we'll be the ones to say how it's varying on a time scale of weeks. We'll go back to source after source after source, and we'll have catalogs of how these systems behave as they go through state evolutions, uh, if they have strange instabilities, and so on. We'll be the ones uh, to know this. Uh, so I, I guess um, in terms of the, the trade-offs, for uh, continuum fitting science. Um, I, yeah, let me, um, the, the punchline of exploring uh, what happens when we make these different cuts and, and so on is that we want to make sure that we have enough throughput to handle uh, millions of events per second. I think that's, I'm sure that's challenging, but I think that's very important in terms of taking advantage of the capabilities of uh, Strobex on stellar mass black hole science. Uh, and if possible, I think the, the area of biggest gain in terms of, uh, you know, if we lose some effective area that, that 
squeezes a little bit these time scales that we can access, but it's not so severe for continuum science. Where I think it does matter more is if we can push that 30 keV limit to a 40 or a 50 keV limit. I don't know how possible that is, but if that is possible, uh, by having that extra grasp of higher energy, that really makes a big difference for how well we can do in anchoring the power law component to access the thermal continuum. Um, uh, yeah, with that, I'll wrap, I'll, I'll end and just put up these little highlight ideas for discussion, presumably on Wednesday. Thanks.